Um, well, we just ought to get on the verbal behavior pretty yes, soon, don't you think? I was thinking that. <laughs> um, we've come this far in the discussion, and we are supposed to be talking about verbal behavior, and yet I haven't uh, asked you to explain your definition of verbal behavior and how it differs from mm -hmm. nonverbal behavior. Could you do that for us? Uh, yes. First, however, I uh, want to correct you. You said uh, my book was about verbal behavior or language. Now, in the book, I defined a language as a verbal culture. It is people speaking, texts read, and so on, which alter the behavior of, of speakers. Uh, language, English, English language is not saying anything, not speaking. I do speak English. In other words, what I say is verbal behavior has been shaped by English as a verbal environment. And when I speak French, that has been shaped by, alas, not the French environment, but book learning and so on. Uh, the languages are on the side of the reinforcing contingencies. And when you study language, you study current practices in the verbal community, which is not speaking at all, but reinforcing speaking. And that is why linguists have so often confined themselves almost entirely to the behavior of the listener. Uh, Chomsky and others, is this, is this a grammatical sentence? That's not a question about verbal behavior. It's a question about the listener or the reader. Is, that, is a listener or a reader responding effectively to that particular verbal pattern? And so they begin to analyze the structure of the language, and as is structuralism of, of the worst kind. Now, meanwhile, someone has had to be speaking, and that is the product of what listeners have done over years of, uh, of contact with the speaker. But verbal behavior is behavior. A language is the word for a verbal environment, and it is studied as such, and has always been studied as such, by linguists. There are all the languages in the world, that doesn't mean all of the verbal behavior that's been going on. It means these are the cultures which have shaped different kinds of verbal behavior. Now, verbal behavior is what I'm doing right now. I'm making noises. And I'm making the noises which have had certain kinds of consequences. The first time I said dada, my father was in ecstasy, I dare say. Oh, he called me dada. And so I was hugged and uh, given all sorts of goodies and so on. And ever since, I went on calling him Dada or Daddy. Actually, it was Papa, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's not quite so easy for a child to say Papa, apparently. But anyway, the, my whole <coughs> repertoire has been shaped by the kinds of consequences that have followed. And those kinds of consequences are the things which have created general principles to all languages. The fact that there are universals is made a great deal of, that all languages have certain common features. Well, of course they have, because there are common reasons why people have reinforced my behaviors in these various ways. And there are, in all languages, there are questions. Uh, what did you say? Uh, or what is that? Um, in all languages, there are negations. Uh, no, not that. Um, in all languages, there are things talked about, there are actions talked about, and so on and so on. Um, these are the universals because they are the universals of the contingencies of reinforcement responsible for verbal behavior, not any one particular set, such as Greek or Latin or, or French or English. What's the definition, then, of verbal, be of verbal behavior? Well, verbal, be verbal behavior is behavior which differs from nonverbal behavior in the nature of its reinforcement. If I touch that glass and pick it up, I've got a glass in my hand. 
and I could have done that if there had been glasses before the species ever acquired verbal behavior. If I say, hand me that glass, please, and someone hands it to me, I, my, re my response, hand me that glass, is reinforced by someone else. Now that uh, reaching and picking that up shapes some very specific muscles in my hand and some related to some strict stimuli from, from the glass to my eyes and so on. Nothing of that sort is involved if I say, hand me the glass, please. Uh, so my verbal behavior is going to be very different. It's, it's shaping my muscles here in different patterns, but only in ways which have produced certain consequences in a quite different way. So the behavior shaped by contingencies of reinforcement like that as one kind of thing, the behavior of vocal behavior shaped by consequences will be very different. And that is why uh, my book simply traces all of the differences between verbal behavior and nonverbal behavior which come from that distinction. From the fact that the reinforcers are mediated somebody from the else, Somebody the else was, must be, you know, no solitary person ever began to talk. Mm -hmm. Is the behavior of the listener verbal then? I would say no, uh, except when uh, you are speaking along with the speaker, and we do that a great deal. Uh, if we hear people sing the Star Spangled Banner before a ball game, we're probably saying it along with what we're hearing mm -hmm. if we are very loyal people. Um, and when we read a poem we know very well, we are seeing it, seeing it along with, uh, with the speaker. And, uh, it, um, even though he may be dead for several hundred years, uh, he said it and, and in reading it you are saying it. You're not just responding to it. The first time you responded to it, you had no, no cues to, to lead you to say it yourself. First time you read a poem, you word after word, but after that, just you've heard this and done this a thousand times, you're ahead of the text, and the text is prompting. You may forget it and just recite the poem. Then you, then you are the listener, who, the reader who is saying it. I'm going to come back to the question of the, of the, list, the speaker and the listener. All right. Uh, you may remember that it has puzzled me for some time. Many people would 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 say, I probably you you and I would agree that the, the what the listener does is every bit as complicated as what the speaker does. But you're saying that it's of a, in what way is it different, except for not making noise? Well, the the listener is responding to stimuli. For example, I'm a cook and I, and I either ring the triangular bell, chow is ready, or I just call out, chow. Now, what's the difference between coming to the bell or coming to the, uh, the sounds I make? Both are verbal, though, because I don't ring bells unless people do come. But on the side of the listener, it's no more verbal than coming when the tea kettle whistles. You, you uh, do respond to one thing because something else has accompanied it in the past. And I don't see verbal, uh, I don't see listeners doing things that they don't do to nonverbal environments. They may not be doing things, I mean, picking up a glass and handing it to you, mm -hmm. uh, I could do, as you say, whether or not you had asked for the glass of water, yeah. but it's all, the argument is often made uh, by psycholinguists that we're dealing with, with, quotes, language in two forms, the productive side, the, re the receptive side, um, or the comprehension side. If, if you as you do, speak in long, complicated, academic sentences. Yeah. Um, I have to, quotes, process that stream of sound to make sense of it. You have been af affected by cognitive psychologists. Are you processing? What does that mean? 
Are you grinding wheat? Are you distilling oil? What, what is this process? Um, you are doing something, yes. And I can, if, I have to, I, if I don't start with you now to discover this, I start with you as a small child uh, whose mother said, dinner is ready. And you came and, or she said, stop doing that, and you stopped. You, you learn to do, you learn to stop doing in response to stimuli, which would be just as much as uh, uh, not touching something if it's hot or, or picking something up when it looks appetizing and so on. You are responding to stimuli in terms of what has happened to you when you responded to them in the past. And that's not verbal behavior. It happens to be verbal stimuli because they were produced by a speaker, but that doesn't, mean, that doesn't make any difference in what you're doing and the nature of what you're doing. Well then, uh, whether we call it verbal or not, let's, let's confine the term verbal to that which the speaker well, does. Well, I think the speaker is very, really, the listener is very really important. Yeah. I have a paper that I gave at Arbo last year on the, on the behavior of the listener. I think it needs to be looked at very closely, and I may have neglected it a bit in my book, but I was talking about verbal behavior, which is the behavior of the speaker. I was assuming the kinds of consequences that shape that behavior. Um, we haven't yet come to talking about the, a new field of research that has risen in the last couple of decades on the verbal capacities of non-human species. Yes. You and your associates taught a small bit of verbal behavior to two mm -hmm. pigeons. Irene Pepperberg is teaching verbal skills to a parrot. Lewis Herman to dolphins. Ron Schusterman to sea lions. I've taught a dozen verbal responses to a monkey, and several exceptionally dedicated research teams have taught extensive verbal repertoires to some chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this work? Can it teach us anything basic about verbal behavior, or do you think it's just a demonstration of our animal training skills? Well, I have always supposed that other species can engage in verbal behavior. And I think you could say that my book proves it, if the book is a valid account, because in it I discuss a wide range of kinds of verbal behavior, from poetry to logic to military commands to casual conversations, all in terms of processes first discovered in research on animals. Now, it doesn't surprise me at all if you can show me uh, something like verbal behavior in other species, but I think there are two restrictions. I think you've got to teach it because no other species has developed a language and remember, I'm talking about a verbal culture when I say language. I don't believe that chimpanzees have a language which is not due to natural selection rather than operant conditioning. And that's a very big distinction. I don't question the language of bees or the language of territorial markers and so on and so on. Those things have proved to be important for the species, and they have evolved through natural selection, survival as a consequence, well-being of the individual and survival of the species, and that is that. But they have never developed a language in the sense of a verbal environment which reinforces verbal behavior. That's very important, I think. Um, in the case of the chimps, it's very, you, you can also, well, I think you could also say this for almost all of the species, that only in the human species is the vocal musculature under operant control. Now, there are parrots and minor birds and so on that imitate sounds, and once they have done that, you can reinforce particular patterns to get something very, which looks more like uh, human verbal behavior. However, 
You can use sign languages or lexicons and so on, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and get the same thing in animals that can't control their vocal apparatus. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's that. Now, how far can you go in teaching? Well, that all depends upon how much time you have uh, to arrange the equivalent of the verbal environment which the species doesn't have. And I think the one good reason uh, why they haven't developed that is that the consequences are always slightly deferred, and that makes it very, I don't think you can, I, I would assert this, and I think it's very, I like to have ethologists uh, answer me on this. Is there any species that models behavior not because of natural selection, but because of the operant consequences? I doubt it. I, uh, you know, the experiment with the, the monkeys that started washing the, the, the sweet potatoes. One did uh, an accident, I suppose, that uh, a sweet potato in salt water tasted better with a little salt and was also cleaner and less gritty. Uh, but that, that young monkey went on doing that. Uh, it was never imitated by adults because they don't imitate young. It was imitated by other young. And then when they grew older, the young began to imitate them, and then they all eventually uh, practiced this. But it, and then that was due to operant reinforcement. That was not an evolved practice. And could be, there would be a state, mistake to call it a, a, an instinct. If you came upon that, you'd say they had an instinct, unless you knew something about the history, of course. Now uh, that's, uh, but I don't believe even then, that one of those monkeys ever showed another monkey how to, uh, or to hold it to, or coerced it, forced it to do this. But I just don't think the consequences of showing, modeling, are quick enough to have been effective in any other species except man. Now, I'd like to know whether that, you can always say something looked like it, but do you find a regular standard practice? Of course you do uh, at the level of natural selection, some birds fly where their young can see them and they're more likely by imitating them to fly sooner. That's, that's modeling, uh, no question about that. And that is, it is the survival of the species that makes a difference. And the problem there is that that is, it is always a, a, is always a deferred, deferred consequence. The survival of the species or even uh, the survival of the individual is always a deferred consequence. But natural selection can work that way. But deferred consequences cannot work on operant conditioning. I don't think animals model behavior, and I don't think they talk to each other unless someone has constructed very specific contingencies of reinforcement. And that's, of course, what these people working with chimpanzees do. Um, I want to pursue deferred consequences. You didn't, you didn't intend to say that deferred consequences cannot work in the human case, can you? I mean, a verbal organism mm. can be controlled by deferred consequences. But because of the verbal behavior, you see, I don't believe, I have a big conflict, uh, conflict here with my colleague, Richard Hernstein, I don't believe that net gain ever explains behavior. And net gain, how you come out in the long run, is a product of certain contingencies of reinforcement which are immediate. And there are very good reasons why those immediate consequences have have evolved because they have, in general, produced a net gain for the culture. Net gains are cultural consequences which work only through mediation. If you do this, you, this will happen. Okay, then I do it because I have learned in response to those if-then statements to do because consequences have followed what I have done. But without the verbal mediation, I don't think any human being is modified by what happens an hour later, let alone a month later, or the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it happens. I, th I can't imagine how it could have evolved to happen that way. I, th I think the, b the ongoing behavior has got to be somehow still ongoing to have the reinforcement affected. And in, in my work with rats, uh, three or four seconds begins to damage the whole thing very much, and even then, it may very well be that there are conditioned mediators, 
uh, Furster and I got a pigeon to do something where something had happened 50 minutes later, but we had to move up second by second to get that. And you're, you do this now because the condition that follows was something you, you could do something in and so on and so on. You learn to do something because it produces a condition under which something will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And then you have to stretch that period of time out very slowly in the process we call shaping. Mm -hmm. Shaping and chaining, you're talking yes, about. Yes, right. Yes. Um, you said that the, how far we can take other organisms, other species, uh, into a verbal mm -hmm. into verbal behavior yeah. uh, depends upon how long we have to train them. Yes. Do, do you think that uh, there would be no theoretical limits or no practical limits on how far we can teach uh, another species? Right. Well, I think it's like Chomsky saying that there are an infinite number of sentences, uh, but uh, you have to say given an infinite number of, amount of time. Uh, and uh, I can't say on this, but I, I would, would make some estimates. Uh, there was someone a long time ago who taught dogs to do things in response to verbal instructions and claim something of the order of, of, of 100 or more responses. The dog's a listener, though, remember, mm -hmm. in that case, not a speaker. Mm -hmm. Now, you can get, uh, if you can get different kinds of responses, which are really distinguishable as, and of course, one of the great advantages of verbal behavior is the patterning that makes possible thousands of responses in a very short, of a very small size. If you can get several of those, you can get a pigeon, someone has done this recently, you get a pigeon to stand on one foot or to flip one wing, and so on. These are words. Uh, you stand on one foot for something, you flip your wing for something else, you nod your head for something else, and so on. It can be done. That's the sign language of the pigeon. Uh, you can build up a reasonable repertoire, but you very soon run into trouble. How many different responses have you got? And I'm sure that the sign language is a problem, too, there, because uh, there, there's a point at which they're no longer distinguishable f functionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be, even in the human sign language, they tend to be rather sketchy kinds of, of things. But if you could, it is a question of how many different topographies of response are available and how much time have you to bring them under the control of, one, different consequences to ask for different things, two, Different, uh, different settings in which they are reinforced, tacting in the terms of my book. That is, uh, you say this when the color is red, you say that when the color is blue, you say that when the color is green, and so on. Do you know the names of the colors? Well, you build, build up. You got half, maybe by the time you get to 12 or 13, you're getting very, very close on the colors, and they won't have the fancy names like mauve and whatnot. But you could go quite a long way, and I don't see any reasonable limit there except the limit, your limit, or the limit of some apparatus you can make to do this more precisely. Uh, you could have, if the pigeon is pecking the names of things, I've done it with four, four colors. You turn it on, the pigeon pecks red or you know, whatever the color is, it does it very well. And you could, if you had a much bigger array, as, the, uh, as, as it can be done with, with chimps and so on, you can get naming of a large number of things or properties of things. You can get man's asking for things, naming for things, and uh, you can get repetition. Uh, you do it and, and the organism does it. This is what happens when you teach someone how to say something. Uh, say, uh, say uncle and you say uncle. And uh, that can be, that echoic behavior, you can build that up. Uh, you. I doubt very much whether you can get what I call intraverbal behavior. It, after you have uh, spoken many, many uh, words and read many, many things and so on, there are certain tendencies for the topographies to be together. If, you're, if, you're in the, if you are in a situation in which you may say house, you may very well say home too. So if I ask you to respond to me without repeating what I say, and I say house, you say home. And 
people almost invariably do that. There are standard things, colors, red, and so on. Uh, this is due to the frequency of, of contiguity, how often they have been together in a large repertoire. Well, you'd have to have a very large repertoire with a chimp before you, you got that. You could, you could teach it to say house when you say home, but that's not intraverbal. That's just general. Uh, it's a response that has been set up by sp specific contingencies. Intraverbals are something which come about through generalized contingencies of a very large, very great variety. Hmm. And when you go, when you get beyond that to what I call the autoclitics and so on, I see no, I see no hope of building that up. Why? If I, if I say to you, as I just said, and I say something, as I just said, has the effect of alerting you to the fact that you are going to hear something again that I know and I'm not just repeating myself because I'm an idiot and so on, or that you haven't under responded so I'm saying it again and so on. Um, and as, uh, to repeat, as I've just said, uh, those are, are autocritics in the sense that they affect what I'm going to say and make it have a different effect on you. And of course, they're extremely common. And uh, they're very much a part of ordinary discourse. Well, I can't believe that you're going to get uh, a chimp to say, uh, as I said before, that's red. <laughs> Point to red. Uh, there's no, the contingencies which lead me to say it are very subtle. And that's too big a repertoire needed. Oh, so you, so you do think there are differences between species in the size of the repertoires they can Well, uh, I, I, think it, I think it's far beyond any other species because we have to teach them everything. You see, we, we are, our verbal behavior, Chomsky thinks I think we have to teach everybody what everything they say, but our verbal behavior is a product of an enormous contact for thousands of hours with speaking people. And that's where a lot of this comes from. You won't find very small children using many autoclitics. They will, as their verbal behavior becomes more subtle, then they will begin to use them. Mm -hmm. Smooths over many misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you've given examples of autoclitics of a type that is a sort of um, meta-commentary on what's what is being said, and yes. as you said, it affects the way the listener responds. Mm -hmm. What about grammatical patterning in general, which is an issue of still a hot issue in the, in the psychology of language? What, but what is the nature of grammatical be behavior? Well, I think this autocritic is the answer to that. As you speak, you, you push the listener around by putting things in your speech so that the listener will respond in ways which will be reinforcing to you. And I think that's what grammar is. If I say house, uh, house blue, I don't, or house white instead of white house, it isn't because uh, I'm applying grammar, but because I've grown up in a world in which I've thousands of times said white house and perhaps millions of times heard white house or read white house, rather than white than house white. These are, are the ways we do things in a, in a particular culture. You've got to put one or the other in. The Latin didn't need, didn't need it. You, there you, had to, you had to agree. The word for house had to agree with the word for white. When you could put it anywhere you wanted in, uh, in Latin. The famous passage, lente, lente, what is it? Oh, I've forgotten it now, but... Uh, Lente, lente, curate, noctis, noctis equi. Slowly, slowly run horses of the night. As you, the, the night is supposed to, the sun was carried across somewhere in the, uh, and started again the next day, you see. Mm -hmm. Now we say it precisely the other way around. Uh, uh, horses of the night run slowly, slowly. Uh, you use horses uh, as an address. All horses of the night run slowly, slowly. Now, we can do that. We do that because that's the way we, have, we make sentences. 
uh, in Latin, you could do it because that sounded good, you see. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't have to be in a particular order, and that was a terrific advantage for a, a language that has uh, grammar of that kind, which identifies adjectives with nouns and verbs with tenses and whatnot and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has all been, been worked out. It's just a way of being effective, of doing the kinds of things that will produce a result. So when you speak about verbal behavior, you're not talking only about little pieces of verbal, little responses, uh, a given noun form or a given verb form. Is there any limit then to the size or complexity of uh, of responding that could qualify as a unitary functional operant? Well, if you were asking me to say that we are all egalitarian and that chimpanzees are the equal of, of uh, human beings, I would say no, as I would say that human beings are not equal to their other. I don't suppose that an autistic, severely autistic child could ever acquire an, an adequate repertoire for daily life, let alone read Shakespeare. No, there are differences, and they are differences in ability and in how well things are taught and how much time there is to teach. I, th I think uh, schools are a disaster because they take too much time to teach what they teach. And then it's not a fair judgment to say that their students aren't bright and aren't learning and so on. They're not teaching. And that can, they can be taught faster, and, and uh, we could all not only learn to read very much faster than we do, but enjoy reading rather than struggle to, in, to read a want ad. As, as a, if you do that, you can graduate from a New York high school. Where do you, what do you think uh, are critical areas for research on verbal behavior in the future? Where, what should we be mm. working on and focusing on? Well, of course, I never thought anything would be on verbal behavior as such. It would be on the processes, the basic processes, which produce rebel behavior, and I think it's, it's what is being done now, and there is a, there's a special interest group that is, is publishing a journal on, on rebel behavior as, as I define it, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all very, very good, and it will be certainly, uh, it will certainly deal with how verbal responses affect other verbal responses or nonverbal behavior. And I think that's very important to how children acquire behavior, either as a developmentalist ought to be doing it by how, how it turns up in an ordinary daily life environment, or how fast it could be taught by designing a more effective contingency to reinforcement. That's essentially what I've done with these centers which teach reading much, much faster, about twice as fast as classrooms can teach it. That's producing verbal behavior of a, of a kind, a textual behavior. No question that can be done. And it ought to be done in our schools because we're not, not teaching reading well enough to make it possible for them to learn much else. Uh. I think we run out. I think we run out too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a very enjoyable discussion. Oh, that's for and me too. I know that uh, uh, our thank students you. Are, and other people are going to be enjoying. Thank you. I hope they do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs>